So, just before I start, the video streaming will be disabled for viewer online. This is not a bug, this is a feature. So, my name is Francis Daniel, and I will show you how you can verify and sign eBPF program using Inspector Gadget. First of all, what is eBPF? According to Brendan Gregg, a kernel developer, eBPF does to Linux what JavaScript does to HTML. With eBPF, instead of a fixed kernel, you can now write many programs that run on events, like disk I.O., which are run in a safe virtual machine in the kernel. So let's now take a look at what we have in the kernel, which is related to eBPF. So first of all, we have the BPF syscall. It is the main entry point to the eBPF subsystem. The BPF subsystem call, it acts a bit like an I.O. cutter. You will have plenty of flags to do different stuff. So first of all, you will want to load an eBPF program inside the kernel by using the syscall and the corresponding flag. So once you load your eBPF program in the kernel, it will be handed to the verifier. The verifier will verify the program. For example, it will ensure that there is no infinite loop, or that you do not dereference a null pointer, once the verifier deems it safe, it will hand it to the just-in-time compiler, which will translate the eBPF bytecode to the machine code. With the BPF syscall, you are also able to create specific data structure, like which are named eBPF maps. Note that you have plenty of different types of maps. You have array, hash map, ring buffer, path buffer, plenty of them. So, to actually write an eBPF program, you will use your favorite text editor. You will write it in a syntax which is nearly that of C. And then you will compile your eBPF program to eBPF bytecode by using the clone compiler and specifying the eBPF target. So in your eBPF object file, you will have information over your program and your maps. So let's say that in the remaining of this example, we wrote a program which traced the exact syscall and which will get the command, the name of the command, which actually was uh, created by the exact syscall. And it will store this into a map, for example, a perfring buffer. So you will load your eBPF program inside the kernel Nowadays, very few people use the BPF syscall directly because it is quite complex. So we rely on eBPF-related libraries like libbpf for C, CDUM eBPF for Golang, libbpf RS for Rust, because though this library, they offer some helpers to interact with the BPF syscall. So the first step is to load your eBPF program to the kernel, the verifier and sure everything is okay, the just-in-time compiler does its job compiling it. And so it will be installed as a hook, for example, a hook to the exact syscall. So we will also create the um, uh, associated map, the pair frame buffer that we want to use by using this, li this library. Now at runtime, if I have a process, for example, bash calling ls, then it will create ls by using the exact syscall. And so the BPF program will be run because the exec score was triggered, it will write the information in the eBPF map, and by reading the eBPF map from user space, we will be able to get the information that the exec score was actually invoked to create the LS process. So eBPF seems quite appealing and quite cool, but it has some problems. So first of all, with eBPF, you have some helpers. So these are some functions that um, you can call from the eBPF context and which will act on the kernel or maybe give you some information over the kernel. So for example, if you want to get the current task, then there is an helper to do that and plenty of other helpers. So some of them can be used in a bad way. The first one, the BPF override return, which as the name suggests, override the return value of the function that it is actually traced. So with this, for example, you can return an error code as uh, the return value of the exact syscall. So 
This helper can really be used in a bad way, so hopefully it needs a specific kernel option, config bpfk probe override, which is not set in distribution kernel. You only set this for test purpose only. The second one is the BPF send signal, which can be used to send signal to other processes on the machine. So with this, from the BPF context, you can actually kill another application by, use, by sending either sick stop or sick kill. Moreover, despite the fact that eBPF programs are verified and deemed safe, the verifier itself is not flawless. It was the subject to some CV around the last year, and particularly the last one, CV 2023-2163, was only fixed at the end of 2023 in 6.3 kernel. So the impact in BPF component by this CV was the path pruning. So the verifier will also do for you some optimization. So for example, if you have a if false, the verifier will be smart enough to know that this path will never be taken, and so we will remove all the eBPF bytecode associated to this path. And so this path pruning uh, function was actually abused to uh, get a root shell in uh, by using this CV. So I propose you that we take a look at a short recorded demonstration of this CV. So the the CV was actually found by people from Google, and so the exploit was also written by them, and I only used the exploit. I did not write it myself. So I ran it in a virtual machine using the 6.2 kernel, so a kernel which does not have the patch. And so, as you can see, we get a root shell inside the virtual machine. So, yeah, this CV can actually be used in a bad way. So, now, my presentation is about Inspector Gadget, and as a maintainer of it, I should um, describe it a bit. So, as stated in our project documentation, Inspector Gadget is a set of tools and framework for data collection and system inspection on Kubernetes cluster and Linux host using eBPF. So, with Inspector Gadget, you have a set of tools that we wrote that we we'll call the official gadget, but you can also write your own gadget and this is really useful for you and for the remaining of the presentation. So Inspector Gadget targets two different contexts, Kubernetes cluster with the IG Kubernetes binary and the Linux host with the IG run. Note that IG can also be used as a daemon in this particular context. For Kubernetes context, we deploy it by using diamond set. So you have one pod for each node of your cluster and inside this pod, we have the gadget container running the IG Kubernetes binary. To interact with all this binary, we have the kubectl gadget to interact with the IG Kubernetes side. Note that you can also use headlamp, which is a Kubernetes UI, and you can also write your own client because the communication uses gRPC here. And to interact with IG when run as a daemon, we have the gadget cuttle binary. So Inspector Gadget does plenty of things for you, and one major thing that it does is what we call enrichment. By doing enrichment, we will map low-level information. For example, an exec Cisco was done with higher-level information in which Kubernetes namespace this Cisco was done, by which container was it done, and all this sort of thing. Not that by using what we call operators, you will be able to sort, filter, and format the information that you get from eBPF. In the remaining of this presentation, I would like to focus on the OCI operator because this is the one that we use to package the eBPF program in Inspector Gadget. So, in Inspector Gadget, we name our tool Gadget, and a Gadget is simply an OCI image containing different elements. The first, and really important, are the eBPF program. Not that you can have one or many. For plenty of our gadgets, we have generally two eBPF programs, one for AMD64 architecture, the other for ARM64 architecture. You can also add some WASM modules if you want to do specific enrichment. There is also some metadata in the YAML format, which will give you some information about the gadget itself and can also be used to write um, help uh, information with regard to how to use this gadget. 
And you can also add some BTF gen information, which will be really useful if your kernel lacks BTF information, then you will be able to use this gadget here. So by using OCI image, we have two big advantages. The first one is that we can share the gadget like container image with um, user experience, uh, which is almost that of Docker. You can push and pull image, you can run them, and we can also sign them like container image, and this is really important. So to sign them, we rely on, uh, we rely on cosign, and we do this in our CI for uh, each commit on main, for all our release, and it is quite simple as using cosign in the CI by using the sign subcommand, by giving the private key we want to use to sign, giving dash dash yes because we're running in the CI, so we do not have, a, a, we will not be prompted. And by using the dash dash recursive, we will be able to uh, sign the whole image in case of, for example, we have different layers, for example, one for AMD64, the other for ARM64. So note that in the case of our official gadget, they are signed with our official private key and we give also somewhere which is easily available the corresponding public key. So by doing so, it has two side effects. The first one is that it will push a signature and the second is that it will push a payload to the container repository where your image, where your gadget lives. So let's take a look in practice of how we do the verifying of a gadget by, very, by leveraging the cosine and ORAS API. So let's say, for example, I have the inspector gadget repository, then I have my developer laptop. I want to run, let's say, the trace exec gadget. So I will run it with the AG run trace exec, specifying the digest of the, of the gadget I want to run. It will pull the gadget locally, in my developer laptop. Then by using the digest, we will get also the corresponding signature. Inside the signature, which is simply a JSON object, we will have different information. So we will have the digest of the payload. And then we will also have the signature, which was actually generated during the signature process. So thanks to the digest contained contain in the signature, we will get the payload. And then we will feed some information in what we call a verification process. So the verification process will take as input the public key, which corresponds to the private key used to sign the gadget, the actual signature, and the payload itself. If the gadget was signed by using the, the private key corresponding to the public key, everything is okay and the execution can continue, otherwise execution will be denied. Note that for developer purpose, we have a flag to disable this behavior, but use it on your, at your own risk. After we verified, we need to do one extra step, is to ensure that what we verified corresponds to what we signed. So we take a look at the payload, which is also a JSON object, and in the payload, we should have the exact same digest as that of the gadget. Let's now say that you wrote your own gadget, you push it to your repository and you sign it too. So let's try to run your gadget. So to run your gadget and to, be, to pass the verification process, you will need to give your public key by using the dash dash public key flag. So note that this Flag can take several public key, so you can give your public key as well as, our, as the official one. And so since your gadget was signed with your private key and that you give your public key, everything is okay and the execution will be allowed. Let's now take a look at a case where you want to, to run a gadget which was not signed. So there is no signature and no payload in this repository. This time, the, verifi the verification process will fail because it is lacking the signature bytes and the run will be denied. So let's now take a look at how it is done in Kubernetes context. Because in Kubernetes context, you cannot give the public key at runtime. Otherwise, it means that everyone can give the public key at runtime. And so this would not be really secure. So the public key in this context they are set once at deployed time. 
So the first step is to deploy the inspector gadget to your Kubernetes cluster. So by deploying the diamond set, then a pod, then a container. And so we have the inspector gadget container running in your Kubernetes cluster. And so we actually give at deploying time two public key. So the official one and yours, because you want to run some of your gadget. And so the inspector gadget container will have the information over these two public keys so that it can use both during the verification process. Now let's say we want to run the trace exec, the official one, then the trace exec will be verified. Execution will be allowed because Inspector Gadget was able to pass the verification process using the corresponding public key. And now we want to use your gadget. So let's say that you modify the trace open to add information about the type of the file system where the open is done. And so here, the execution will also be allowed because Inspector Gadget has the knowledge about your public key. So as a conclusion, you can use, uh, you can store eBPF program in OCA image. They can easily be signed using cosine. As you can see, just a matter of adding one call in your uh, CI. And then Inspector Gadget will, in this case, verify them by leverage the cosine and ORAS API. So as a future work on Inspector Gadget side, we would like to add an air gap mode. So instead of deploying first the gadget container in Kubernetes context, and then pulling the gadget that we want to run, we would like to deploy first the gadget with, a, with first the gadget container with some already packaged gadget. And so this would be, this would avoid us to do the pull each time we want to run a gadget. So if you are curious about Inspector Gadget and want to know more about it, of course, you can ask me a question and it will be a pleasure for me to answer them. But you can also find us on our website, so inspectorgadget.io. All the development with regard to Inspector Gadget occurs on GitHub, so github.com slash inspectorgadget slash inspectorgadget. So if you found a problem by using it, and for example, you want to open an issue, they are welcome, you want to review a bit of code, or there is something which isn't clear in the documentation, every contribution are really welcome, and it will be a pleasure for me to review them, and to take a look at them, and to give you some advice on how to, to um, contribute to Inspector Gadget. And of course, we are uh, active on the Kubernetes Slack in the Inspector Gadget channel. So it's the end of my presentation, and if you have a question, it would be a real pleasure for me to answer them. So basically, you are saying that with libpf, you are able to write uh, at runtime um, ebpf bytecode by using some instruction, which is the case. And so you are wondering if it, uh, if the signing here will cover it, right? So sadly, no. <laughs> and uh, so the, the only thing that we unsure here is that it's like, for example, uh, I send you a package. 
You know, I go to the post office, I send you a package. Then the only thing that this process ensures is that the package was not tempered during the, during the delivery. Once you deliver it, if, for example, it was the package was from, for someone from your family, and you take it, and then you decided to modify it and then give it to this person in your family, then this process would not cover it. So everything which occurred on the developer laptop, sadly, we cannot do more about it as now. So yeah, this thing is only for the, the delivery of the, of the OCI image. But uh, yeah, definitely, I mean, here, the, the thing that, I, uh, that we do in Inspector Gadget is that we want to be a framework for uh, eBPF programs. And so eBPF is really low level. Some people are a bit afraid of using it. And so we need to give a bit of, uh, a, bit of uh, a safe net. Say that, OK, this is what we can offer to you. But yeah, Inspector Gadget, sadly, we need to use the CAPSIS admin when we deploy it in the Kubernetes cluster. And so I tried to harden everything and to reduce the attack surface as much as possible. But I'm tied with CAPSIS admin to interact with some fanotify stuff to do the enrichment. So yeah, sadly, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, problematic here. So one, one thing maybe, but I'm, I need to I need to think more about uh, finding uh, finding a way. I know that there are some. I know that there are, at one moment there was some project or maybe some thinking to do something in the kernel with regard to eBPF program themselves. You know, to with regard to signing, like for like for example, what we have with modules. You can restrict the kernel to only load signed modules. And so this is really a good thing, and I would really like to to see something like this in the in the kernel. And uh, if something like this exists in the kernel, I would definitely, I would definitely jump on it to take a look at it and then to code it in Inspector Gadget because yeah, this is really important. Yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. But um, nowadays, you know, we're using Cori and uh, everything with regard to uh, BTF. I'm not sure that there is still a, a real use case of dynamically creating it, you know, at runtime. So the, the only use case I can think about is in Cilium eBPF, they are actually doing that for their test. So instead of, you know, having a binary in their, in their repository, they generate the, um, the eBPF program at runtime, and so then they are able to test it. But yeah, other than that, um, yeah, out of the blue, I need to think more about it, but out, out of the blue, I do not see really a great use case where you would definitely have to do that. You're welcome. Uh, any other question? Then uh, I sadly do not have any Inspector Gadget stickers to share with you, but I have some really good French chocolate to uh, enjoy with your coffee. So thank you. <laughs>